the origins of Ashkenazi Jews may surprise you. You are about to experience Jackson Snyder Presents, direct from the Vero Essene Yehad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology, and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. Ashkenazi Jews are a Jewish ethnic group who have their earliest ancestors from the indigenous tribes of Israel, or at least on one side of the family tree. A study published in Nature Communications has shown their maternal lineage comes from a different and possibly unexpected source. The research shows the origins of the matrilineal line for the Ashkenazi Jews comes from Europe. This goes against the common belief that Jewish people first arrived in Central Europe after the byzantine sasanian War of 602-628 to and only began settling in Germany in the medieval period. That's good news. Ashkenazi Jews is the term used today to describe these Jewish people, individuals who built religiously based communities centuries later in Central and Eastern Europe. One of the things they are recognized for is the use of Yiddish, a high German language written in the Hebrew alphabet and influenced by classical Hebrew and Aramaic. The co-author of the study, Martin Richards, an archaeogeneticist at the University of Huddersfield in England, said that while Ashkenazi Jews have lived in Europe for many centuries. The results of the study using DNA samples show that most European Jews descend from local people who converted to Judaism, not individuals who left Israel in the Middle East around 2,000 years ago. Ashkenazi Jews were declared a clear, homogenous genetic subgroup following a 2006 study. Ashkenazi Jews come from the same genetic group no matter if their ancestors were from Poland, Russia, Hungary, Lithuania, or another place with a large historical Jewish population. They're all in the same ethnic group. How could it be that Ashkenazi Jews are just one genetic group? The answer is relatively simple. They didn't reproduce at a noticeable level with others outside their group, not even with other Jewish people. They have been a gene pool all to themselves. Researchers have shown Ashkenazi Jews were a reproductively isolated population in Europe for about a thousand years. Previous studies have found that 50 to 80 percent of the Ashkenazi DNA from the paternal lineage originated in the Near East. It's not surprising that there was a common belief that Israel and the Near East was their ancient homeland. But the 2013 study showed 80 percent of Ashkenazi Jews whose maternal line comes from Europe. Only a few people had genes originating in the Near East. Again, that's the maternal line. As Professor Richards said, at the time, this suggests that, even though Jewish men may indeed have migrated into Europe from Palestine around 2,000 years ago, they seem to have married European women. It appears the majority of European converts to Judaism during the early years of the Diaspora were women. That helps explain why the Ashkenazim can trace their female lineage to southern and western Europe. Concluding the study, Richard said, The origins of the Ashkenazim is one of the big questions that people have pursued again and again and never really come to a conclusive view. That is, until now. And we look a little further into this subject now. That is, the surprising discovery that Ashkenazi Jews descend from Europeans, rather than people of the Mideast. We'll go into a little more depth with this Nature Communications article and the genetic roots of the Ashkenazi Jews. And this one is from Kate Yandel in The Scientist, October 8, 2013. 
The majority of Ashkenazi Jews are descended from the prehistoric European women, according to a study published today in Nature Communications that we spoke of in the previous article. While the Jewish religion began in the Near East and the Ashkenazi Jews were believed to have origins in the early indigenous tribes of this region, new evidence comes from mitochondrial DNA, which is passed on exclusively from mother to child. It suggests that female ancestors of most modern Ashkenazi Jews converted to Judaism in the North Mediterranean around 2,000 years ago and later in West and Central Europe. The new findings contradict previous assertions that Ashkenazi mitochondrial lineages originated in the Near East or from mass conversions to Judaism in the Khazar Kingdom, an empire in the North Caucasus region between Europe and Asia lasting from the 7th century to the 11th century, whose leaders adopted Judaism. Well, that really is big news. We knew about the origin in Khazaria, but this study seems to imply, or maybe even prove, that Khazaria had very little to do with it. And I quote, We found that most of the maternal lineages don't trace to the North Caucasus, which would be a proxy for the Khazarians, or to the Near East, but most of them emanate from Europe. Look, we're talking about 2,000 years ago, and that quote was from Martin Richards again, the archaeogeneticist. Richards and colleague's story seems reasonable, said Harry Osterer, a geneticist at Albert Einstein College of the Yeshiva University in New York City. Ah, oh, Einstein College, he must be really smart, but he was not involved in the study. But he says it certainly fits with what we understand about Jewish history. The Ashkenazi Jews make up the majority of Jews today and most recently have ancestry in Central or Eastern Europe. Previous work has demonstrated that just four mitochondrial types passed down from four mothers account for 40% of variation in Ashkenazi Jews' mitochondrial DNA. And some researchers have published evidence of Near Eastern origins for these Ashkenazi mitochondrial types. Let me digest that for a minute. To further investigate the matrilineal lines of the Ashkenazi Jews, Richards and his colleagues looked at mitochondrial genome sequences in living Jews and non-Jews from the Near East, Europe, and the Caucasus. Based on the results, the team concluded that, in contrast to the evidence for many Ashkenazi males whose Y-chromosomal DNA suggests a likely origin in the Near East, the female lineage of Ashkenazi Jews have substantial ancestry in Europe. Specifically, the researchers found that the four main Ashkenazi founder mitochondrial types were nested within European mitochondrial lineages, not Near Eastern ones. And an analysis of more minor haplogroups indicated that an additional 40% of mitochondrial variation found in Ashkenazi Jews' mitochondrial DNA was likely of European origin. The remaining variants appeared to be from the Near East or uncertain origins, and there was no evidence for Ashkenazi Jewish origins in the Khazar Kingdom according to the authors. Well, my friend, if that's the case, we have debunked 45% of anti-Semites' notions concerning the origin of Jews. Historical evidence indicates that Jewish communities began to spread into Europe during classical antiquity and migrated north during the first millennium, arriving in the Rhineland by the 12th century. Where from? Doesn't say. Local European women could have begun to join the Jewish population around 2,000 years ago or earlier. Richards and colleagues suggest, and the Ashkenazis may have contributed to recruit additional women as they head north. But some scientists question these conclusions. 
While it is clear that Ashkenazi maternal ancestry includes both Levantine, that is Near Eastern, and European origins, the assignment of several of the major Ashkenazi lineages to prehistoric European origins in the current study is incorrect in our view. Physician Genesis Doran Behar and Carl Skorecki of the Ramban Healthcare Campus in Israel, whose previous work indicated a Near Eastern origin to many Ashkenazi mitochondrial types, wrote this in an email to the scientist. They argue that the mitochondrial DNA data used in the new study did not represent the full spectrum of mitochondrial diversity. Is everybody wrong? Did they just come out of the sky, these women? Iran El Haik, a research associate studying genetics at John Hopkins University School of Public Health, is split. He agreed with the study authors that the study rules out a Near Eastern origin for many mitochondrial lineages of the Ashkenazis, but disagreed that it rules out a Khazarian contribution. He says, Jews and non-Jews residing in the regions of Khazaria are underrepresented, which biases the result toward Europe as we have seen in many other studies. He said this in an email to the scientist. That's the periodical I'm reading from now. El Haik recently concluded from autosomal DNA that European Jews did, in fact, have a Khazarian background. David Goldstein, a geneticist and director of the Center for Human Genome Variation at Duke University School of Medicine, <laughs> said that the questions of whether there was a Khazar contribution to the Ashkenazi Jews' lineage or exactly what percent of the mitochondrial variants emanate from Europe cannot be answered with certainty using present genetic and geographical data. Even if a set of variants are present in a specific region today, that doesn't mean that the region always had that set of variants. Some variants could have been lost due to drift, genetic drift, or perhaps migration altered the balance of variants present in the population. These analyses really do not have any formal statistical inference about evolutionary history in them. Goldstein wrote in an email to the scientist. They are based on direct interpretations of where one finds different mitochondrial DNA types today, and so the analyses are largely impressionistic. Nevertheless, Goldstein noted that the new study quote, does offer better resolution of the mitochondrial DNA than earlier ones, and so the suggested interpretation could well be right. <laughs> Is he right or is he wrong? Well, I tick off the moments until my Grubhub pizza gets here because I'm starving. No, no meat on that pizza. Don't worry about that. Hmm, is Brother Snyder eating meat on his pizza? Perhaps pork? Hmm, we need to find out. We need to tell somebody if he is. No, no pork, but I probably will put some anchovies on my veggie pizza. No, I, I hope you don't mind if I get back to the subject for a minute. What I get out of this is the latest findings from a few years ago say that the vast majority of European Jews originally came from Europe. The other guys say, no, my study doesn't show that, does not account for what was going on in Khazaria back in 1100 AD. And a third guy, he say, look, I don't think either one of these studies will really show anything. I'm going to just remain believing exactly like I do. He said, she said, it said. I think that's a fair assessment, honestly. That's what it seems to me, but I have a tendency to believe that 2013 study, that the matriarchs, four matriarchs originally, all came from Europe, converted to Judaism, married other Europeans, converted them, or maybe married European Jews, and that a small percent maybe came over from Khazaria, and that a small percent maybe came from the Mideast. But what we have to conclude about this is, 
Well, you know. Uh, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. That would mean that Israel today, being mostly populated by Ashkenazi Jews, that these were not descendants of any Israel tribes. Not at all. And that people that have come back there in our day may not be descendants at all of the ancient Israelites in the dispersion. However, one thing we have to remember is, whether they were or not, sometime along the line they have converted and kept a form of rabbinical Judaism all this time. Am I wrong there, Berla Snyder? No, I, I think you've got it hit right on the head, as usual. But I have a little more of this study maybe I'll read here, and then we'll go on to something else. I found about half a page of the actual results of that 2013 study, but the top half of it is gone. Oh, maybe I'll read a couple paragraphs here. Look pretty good. Jewish communities were already spread across the Greco-Roman and Persian world more than 2,000 years ago. It is thought that a substantial Jewish community was present in Rome for at least the mid-2nd century BCE, maintaining links to Jerusalem and numbering 30,000 to 50,000 by the first half of the first century. By the end of the first millennium, Ashkenazi communities were historically visible along the Rhine Valley in Germany. After the wave of expulsions in Western Europe during the 15th century, they began to disperse once more into Eastern Europe. These analyses suggest that the first major wave of assimilation probably took place in Mediterranean Europe and most likely in the Italian peninsula, with substantial further assimilation of minor founders in West Central Europe. There is less evidence for assimilation in Eastern Europe and almost none for a source in the north. Cut. For a source in the north. Cut. For a source. Cut. For a source in the north. Cut. For a source in the North Caucasus, Shuvashia, as would be predicted by the Khazar hypothesis. Rather, the results show strong genetic communities between West and East Europe Ashkenazi communities, albeit with gradual declines of frequency of founders between East and West. Hmm. There is surprisingly little evidence for any significant founder event from the Near East, fewer than 10% of the Ashkenazi mitochondrial DNA can be assigned to a Near Eastern source with any confidence, and these are found at very low frequency. The most frequency belonging to, well, there's three genes here, are found only at around 3% respectively. All are widespread across Ashkenazi communities and might conceivably be relicts of early Levantine founders. But it seems likely that other more minor Near Eastern lineages are the result of more recent gene flow in the Ashkenazim. The age estimates for the European founders might suggest, oh, very tentatively given the imprecision with the present data, that these ancestral Jewish populations harboring haplogroup K and especially N1b2 may have had an origin in the first millennium BC rather than in the wake of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD. I wondered when they were going to bring that in because that event caused the spread of Jewish slaves all over the Roman Empire. I think literally millions of people from Israel, Galilee, Samaria, Judea, Idumea, were killed or taken into slavery by the Romans after 70 AD, and that would spread them all over the world. In fact, some scholars have argued from historical evidence that the large-scale expansion of Judaism throughout the Mediterranean in the Hellenistic period was primarily the result of <sighs> proselytism and mass conversions. 
especially among women again. We anticipate that a combination of large-scale mitogenome and whole Y-chromosome analysis complementing full human genome sequencing will be able to address this question in much finer detail in the near future. Okay, so that was like seven years ago. Despite the potential of genomic studies, the particular value of full mitogenome sequencing should be stressed as some studies dismiss the value of uniparental markers because of the impact of drift in the Ashkenazim. In fact, the reverse may be the case. Autosomal studies may be confounded by drift, whereas the fine genealogical resolution of full mitrogenomes given matrilinear inheritance found in Judaism since at least around 200 AD and possibly several centuries earlier, helping to fix incoming lineages from converts within the Ashkenazi community after this time, with sufficient resolution, a detailed gen genealogical history for every maternal lineage in the Ashkenazim are now within reach. In fact, it should soon be possible to reconstruct the outlines of the entire dispersal history of each community. Well, that, th those are a lot of difficult words. You wouldn't believe how much editing I'm going to have to do to clean up my stumbling around there. Uh, so now I understand when I read someplace that in Israel, only 2 to 8 percent of the people there have any trace of pre-first century Israelite or Jewish blood. Oh, well, no wonder. So uh, then I submit that the people of Israel now are by and large not classical Israel in any sense. Wow, that is a shocker to me. It was to me, too, when I first saw that, because the popular notion is that everybody in Israel has returned from a pre-first century dispersion or two. But according to both of these records, both of these reports, that's not the case at all. And then your report about the 8 to 2 percent thing, that just puts icing on the cake. Some people need to change their thinking about that, I guess. But what it looks like in some is that the Ashkenazi came out of East and Central Europe and became Jewish through conversion rather than through having ancestors actually from Israel or the tribes dispersed in the first millennium BC. And of course, in the first century, we know of many women that had come around to Judaism as a far nobler and moral religion than the polytheism of Greece and Rome. In fact, it is said that Nero's wife, Popea, herself was influenced by Judaism. And to tell you the truth, since Paul was well known by Nero, and he certainly was well known by Seneca, Paul might have been over there preaching to Popea, who was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in Italy. Beautiful woman and a two-time man. Well, that's all I can do from this scientific report. And if somebody heard that and can explain it to me, please do. I majored in genetics in undergraduate school, and it's all I could do to get through it. It's an interesting subject. How's that pizza coming? Still in the works. This is amazing. I'm seeing on a map on my screen a little car, a pizza delivery car, driving down the streets on the map of Vero Beach, Florida. It's pretty amazing. No contact delivery. I get a pizza once a week, maybe once every two weeks. This particular pizza place, Caps Pizza in Vero Beach, if you're ever here, has absolutely the best veggie pizza I ever had. Um, did, did I hear um, pizza? Yes, you heard pizza. Why, are you hungry? Oh my goodness, I'm looking at your map now, and they're outside right now. Well, I'll tell you what, if you go get it off the porch, then I'll let you have half a piece. How's that sound? So, we done had our pizza, 
and are full, and it was mighty good. And we were talking about the Shroud of Turin. I don't know if you think it is authoritative or not. I do. If you say no and you haven't read the pro studies on it, you should. The blood was taken off that shroud and analyzed. There is a YouTube video on, on this done by a young, very fervent pastor who wanted to show the world that Jesus was in fact a Jew and those that say he wasn't were wrong. So he put together a video and got permission to get some of the blood off the shroud and took it to an analyst to find out the genetic code there and where it came from. And this pastor was a little bit surprised when he found that blood didn't come from the Nazareth Jews. It, it came, came from, from the, the Nazareth, Nazareth Druze. Man, oh man, was that boy shocked. Take some time. I, I can't tell you the name of that video right now, but the conclusions make perfect sense. And what they found in that DNA on the shroud was identical with the Druze people that live in Nazareth today. So who are the Druze? Most people I talk to about that do not know anything about the Druze. Well, I'll end up this session by telling you something about them. They are a fine people, and whether they're considered Christian or not, they certainly act the part better than any others that I know of. At the 25 minute mark, this is a very good time to take a short break. Just who are the Druze, and how might the Shroud of Turin relate them to Yeshua HaMashiach? This is speculative thinking for the thinking believer. I am not making dogmatic statements. This article comes from Ancient Origins. The Druze are a secretive surviving Gnostic community in the Middle East today who publicly claim homogeneity with Islam due to a historical fear of persecution. But in truth, they have nothing in common with Islam, and they don't believe or practice any of the pillars of Islam, or worship any of the Islamic figures revered by both prominent sects of Islam, the Sunnites and the Shiites. The Druze don't practice polygamy, pilgrimage to Mecca, fasting during Ramadan, or any other holy month or period. They don't practice practice prayer in churches, mosques, or any form of ritualistic behavior historically or currently practiced by either Christians or Muslims. The Druze texts are referred to as the Hikmah text, and they are forbidden even for most of the Druze themselves if they're not initiated, that is, ready to receive the knowledge from them. El Hikmah is the Arabic term for wisdom. Sounds like uh, Hebrew, Hikmah. And the Druze scriptures include material from ancient Hermeticism, ancient Greek philosophy, Hinduism, Buddhism, ancient Gnostic Judaism, Christianity, and Sufi Islam. It's a bargain counter religion practiced by some fine people. The Druze were historically forced to assume homogeneity with their Muslim counterparts in the Middle East, where they were planted amidst a sea of Islam. For they were in fear of persecution due to their controversial doctrines and because they strategically have no other choice, especially that they aren't open to conversion. No one who is born of Druze parents could ever become Druze, which rendered them a minority community with this population on the decline. Unlike the Sunnis in the Levant, who have Saudi Arabia backing them, the Shiites who have Iran backing them, the Catholics who have the Vatican backing them, the Orthodox who have Russia and Greece behind them, and the Jews who have a Jewish state, and the Jewish diaspora supporting it, the Jews have no external support. Hence, they historically had no other choice but to assume homogeneity with other religions, defend the land they're on, and serve the state they fall under. Did you listen to my speeches about being a disinterested believer in an evil society? That's the Druze. They have no choice but to assimilate with the neighboring religions and communities to the point of almost dissolving. In Syria, they act in public like they are Muslims. In Israel, they almost cannot be differentiated from the Jews and they serve in the Jewish army and state. In Lebanon, 
they have a bit more freedom, and they coexist with Muslims and Christians equally. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, to keep your identity. The Druze in their community and how it's divided into two, that is the initiated and the non-initiated, their sacred text for their sacred forbidden texts and hidden beliefs can be said to be authentic survivors of ancient Gnostic Christianity, which existed openly till 300 AD, that is the Council of Nicaea in Constantinople, when traces of Gnosticism were removed from the Bible and the Gnostics were considered heretics and sentenced to burning to death on the stake. I think that they've got a mistake here. That wasn't at Nicaea. Nobody was to be burned to death at Nicaea. Nothing was done with the Bible there. That was later. One of the main doctrines that the Druze believed in, the doctrine of reincarnation, was removed from the Bible. It was? The main reason the doctrine of reincarnation was rejected by the Nicaean Council and its traces were removed from the Bible is because if one believes in it, there's no longer any point to pay allegiance to the church or any superior power to reserve a place in the promised heaven or paradise. I think they're historically wrong here. In fact, I am 99% sure of it. Let's talk about the Druze and not about ancient history. If one believes in reincarnation, then one knows that heaven and hell are a state of existence that he or she will experience on earth in this life or another life, and that punishment and rewards are settled through karma. Ultimately, this means that there's no heaven to reserve a seat in or a hell to pay your way out from. Heaven and hell are metaphors for human states of existence one will experience here on earth. From here, there's no logic to worshiping a mediator between you and your destiny or afterlife. There's no escape from your actions through any ritualistic act or payment. The following is an excerpt from the Bible that is mentioned in the al hikmah texts as proof of reincarnation that seems to have skipped the council's attention. But I tell you, Eliyah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. I don't think Yahshua is talking about reincarnation there. According to the Jews' doctrines, Eliyah is the reincarnation of John the Baptist, and this quote hints at the truth. Have done to him everything they wished, refers to the severing of John's head. The Jews visit the shrine of Elia in Syria regularly and considered holy due to their knowledge that he is he is himself John the Baptist, one of the sacred five men they believe in. Finally, reincarnation to the Druze is not and was never a doctrine more so than a logical necessity. The soul has no way to express any state of existence without its vehicle, the body. There's no way a soul can even be punished in or rewarded in any way without the vehicle of sensation that translate the states of punishment and reward through a human experience in a given space and time. Reincarnation doesn't force one to envision an afterlife that a person and has no evidence or idea of, it simply asks one to envision an afterlife in the same form of existence, that is in a body, that one had the most idea and evidence of in the same way one exists here and now. Why has this forbidden simplicity been so hard to accept? Because there's absolutely no evidence for it. Okay, I'll answer that question. Because of how much artificial historical effort has been put to prove it wrong by presenting and promoting and marketing thousands of alternative scenarios of the afterlife. The other key doctrine to the Druze is the doctrine of ancientness of the world. The Druze believe in the Atlantean and Lemurian accounts of the fact that humanity existed in a civilized and advanced state millions of years prior to the 7,000-year Adamic cycle, a belief that challenges the traditional monotheistic belief reflected in a little or literal understanding of Genesis, an account that the Druze believed to be purely symbolic of the spiritual parenthood 
of humanity. Hey, I don't believe in literal seven 24-hour days. I don't know if anybody that's enlightened anymore believes that. We see it symbolically. And was there an Adam and Eve? I believe so. Oh, but I've got to leave this theological stuff for you to look up in my thousand other videos out there. The Druze five-star symbol refers to the five sacred men whom the Gnostics have followed and traced through all their incarnations since primeval Adam, Egyptian, and ancient Greek times. In the ancient Greek times, the five sacred men accounted for in the Druze scriptures are identified as Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Parmenides, and Empedocles. Hence, the Druze consider the works of these philosophers to be sacred, and they don't accept the traditional philosophic approach that highlights a fake conflict between Platonic, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy. The Druze also believe in the sacredness of Socrates, Plotinus, and Alexander the Great. Well, good luck with that. In Christian times, the five sacred men accounted for in the Druze scriptures are identified as Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Druze reject the influence of Peter and Paul over Christianity, that is, the institutionalization of Christianity by way of catering to the secular ruling powers at the time. They believe that Christianity today doesn't reflect the ancient Gnostic Christianity that Jesus Christ intended for humanity. However, the Druze do respect all religions regardless and coexist peacefully with their fellow Jews, Christians, and Muslims. In conclusion, the Druze did exist, holding the same beliefs they exist in now since time eternal, and not only for the thousand years they were known historically as Druze, D-R-U-Z-E, the evidence of such existence is lately confirmed by the discovery of an exact match between the Druze DNA and Messiah's DNA. And this was what I was mentioning before. According to a recent documentary that aired on the History Channel, not mentioned, but there is a link here, I think. Yes, there's a link. And I'll put it in the show notes. It's an hour and a half long. It is good. It's very interesting, whether you agree with the conclusions or not. The Jews of the Levant are acknowledged on an official level to be true descendants of Jesus Christ. In brief, the documentary is based on a genetic study of the Shroud of Turin, the linen cloth that's widely believed to be Yahshua's wrapping following his crucifixion. For the first time in history, a man of faith and a man of science teamed up to search for Jesus DNA. Also in the video, they talk about the Mandelian, which is the cl cloth that was on his head in the tomb. They supposedly have that too with blood on it. And in the video, they say the Druze, the Shroud, and the blood on the Mandelian, Mandelian are all the same. Using the latest advantages in DNA technology, Oxford University geneticist George Busby and biblical scholar Pastor Joe Basile, Basile, wait till you see him, investigated the world's most famous holy relics, including the Shroud of Turin, the Sudarium of Oviedo, and the newly discovered bones of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Their journey took them to holy sites around the world, to Spain, Italy, Israel, and the shores of the Black Sea. By extracting and analyzing samples of each of these holy relics, they were able to retrieve a sample DNA that is highly asserted to belong to Jesus or a member of his family. They believe that by finding this strand of Jesus' DNA, they would be able to identify whom among humanity today are true descendants of Jesus and provide the world with new insights into the man many consider to be the most important person in history. But his name isn't Jesus, it's Yeshua. Their research led them to a discovery of an exact and exclusive match between the Jesus strand and the Druze DNA. In their attempt to verify the authenticity of their discovery, they tested the DNA of an actual Druze father and daughter who currently live in an Israeli village 
at close proximity to Nazareth and found their DNA to match the 2,000-year-old DNA pulled from the Shroud of Turin. That is absolutely amazing. It's so amazing, it's hard to believe. But it's a good thing. And Nazareth and that area have been full of Druze since time immemorial. So, if he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, we're speaking again of that matriarchal DNA, mother had to be a Druze. In short, the Druze preserved their ancient Gnostic descendants through strict marital laws, which they passed on from one generation to another, and which they still practice to this day and age. There's a second article here called Mimidamos and the Gnostic Code, which happens to be a mind science present among the forbidden scriptures of the Druze. How did they get that? Oh, this one's long enough. Maybe we'll go back if anybody's interested in mind codes. I'll just say that the code, according to this article, is a living, breathing soul, not a dead body of historical texts and monuments. It is beyond a recovered scripture, ancient manuscript, or buried scroll. It is beyond religious institutions, beyond ceremonial and behavioral practices, beyond ethical and moral codes of conduct, beyond sacred pillars and holy rituals, beyond traditions and customs, beyond ideologies and systems of thought, beyond meditations and mantras, beyond psychic and occult powers, and most certainly beyond the Sufism and mysticism falsely associated with it. The Mimadamos. Sounds like the Logos there in Hebrews 4. Well, that's enough for now, and I appreciate you subscribing and listening to what I am trying to accomplish here. You don't how, know how much you mean to me. Now, don't give up on Messiah. Only those who have never had a real relationship are the ones that can reject Messiah. It's something I cannot do. For all my life I've known him, and he's taken care of me. It's he who is the Word, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to, well, you know the rest of it. May Yahweh bless you through living in the image of his Son. Amen. Amen.